comment section. Michael, what's going on? Oddly, we don't have any comments on Facebook yet. Why aren't they showing up? How's everybody doing? I'm flying solo right at the moment today. Uh, but we actually are going to have a guest on later today. So go ahead and hop on, throw your comments up on Facebook or YouTube. Let me know what you want to talk about today. We have a guest showing up. He's a sponsored player. Known him for quite a few years now. And we're going to we're gonna have some fun, see what he's been up to. I haven't talked to him in a while, so it'll be fun to catch up. And you can, uh, you can quiz him, quiz me. Tell me what you want to talk about today. Mark says, what's up from Germany? How's it going, Mark? Eh, there's a bunch up. We are, we are kicking butt and taking names. It's been, been, been a good year. Busy year, challenging year, but a good year. Juan says, happy St. Patty's Day. You see, I am very um, <clears throat> diplomatically not wearing orange or green. I'm wearing gray. So, you know. Let's see. We've got a beer of the day. is Einstock Toasted Porter. It's a good one. If you haven't had Einstock, you should check them out. They're, they're good stuff. <clears throat> Charles says, hey, what's up? Somebody said hello from the Netherlands. How's it going over there in the Netherlands? Airflow said he just recovered from a week of COVID. Yep, that's that's how it goes. It's, uh, you know. Well, You know what's funny is my Facebook is acting up right now. I'm going to refresh Facebook. Sorry, I'm totally disjointed today. Um, there we go. Okay, we're still way behind, but... So yeah, we've been super busy. Lots of fun stuff. Uh, did anybody watch 2 minutes and 37 seconds of silence? Because we accidentally posted a live video that had absolutely nothing in it last week. And we decided rather than taking it down, we'd just leave it up there. And if you all needed some Zen time to relax and chill, then we, you know, it was all good. AJ says, super stoked. Again, kudos to you, Rich, and your awesome team. Thank you, sir. It, uh, it's, been, it's been a ride. We appreciate all the support, but we have lots of new stuff uh, coming out this year and even more stuff hopefully hopefully later this year uh is it a brewski yes it is einstock icelandic toasted porter uh einstock is a brewery out of iceland they're quite good <sighs> michael said he watched it two times yeah i mean i figured somebody would enjoy it so there's actually uh there's actually a a famous piece of music <clears throat> uh by john cage I think, uh, that is like four minutes and something seconds of silence, and so we just figured, eh, we'll leave it up there. Here he is. How's it going, man? Good. <clears throat> you, you, you gonna show up and just jump right on the stream? Yeah, sure. Go, go ahead and hop in here. Oh, man. So you, you're sitting at a computer now, so, you know, whatever, you're gonna have to... Do you want to switch? Sorry, here, <laughs> sure. Why don't we switch? That way I'll, uh, I'll steer the computer. All right. All right. So those of you that don't know him, this is Robert from TDZ. So go ahead and tell him about yourself. Uh, so I'm Rob, a.k.a. Jaws, uh, one of the founders of Team Danger Zone. Uh, we were among the first... Uh, sponsor slash collaborators at Wolverine and uh, we've been proud to do some beta testing and uh, promotion stuff and use the excellent products dude uh, one, some of my favorite uh, airsoft gaming time was, was it Shelby two or three it's, uh, I think that was three is that three dude um, we, uh, I, I, I was down at uh, Black Sheep Shelby, and 
the TDZ was on the opposite side, and we yeah. we went at it all game long. I mean, it was <laughs> I don't yeah. know how many times we ran into each other, but it was a it was a good time. Re- really good firefights. Had, had a had a had a good time doing that. So um, it's been a while. What you been up to, man? Oh, I'm uh, trying to figure out what to do with my life. Aren't we all? Making some, <laughs> making some huge changes professionally, uh, looking for a new place to land. Okay. And um, I've been doing some local play and uh, some more events and, and falling in love with the sport again. And Del Freeze Tag is, uh, is a really good time. I haven't it's, been doing enough of it. Yeah, I hear you. It's, it's been, I'm still trying to get out to like one or two like big events a year is sort of my goal. Just like. It's it's hard to it's hard to get out to a ton because, I mean, family and kids and all that kind of stuff yeah. it makes it, you know, hard to get, hard to go for a weekend and just be gone because I'm you know I, I'm right. going to work all week and then it's like well, well I'm going to be gone for the weekend. Contrary to popular belief, you don't do airsoft for a living, right? That's, you run a you run a business. <laughs> that that is funny. People are, and it's it's I mean it's it's true, but like I, I met with my patent attorney. Uh, yesterday, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I met with my patent attorney yesterday, and I show we have like three different things we were looking to patent, and uh, he's <laughs> he just started laughing at one point. He's like, "You guys have too much fun." I was like, "Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah some, I mean, yes, some of it's fun, <laughs> yes, right? but it's a job. You yeah, know, it's, it's work. It's uh, you know, there, there's a lot that <laughs> goes into it." One is giving you a shout out. Hey, one. I, uh, I'm still, I still don't think I've ever met Juan in person. Oh yeah, he's fun. I we've uh, we played together a few times. I don't think I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Juan, but I do not think we've actually met like at an event or anything yet. I think he's maybe coming uh, down for the summit though this summer. So that should no, be that's fun. great. I I gotta give Dion a shout out too. Uh, this is a fun story. I'll try to keep it short. Um, I had a Gen One MTW I'm working on. Uh, I had the thing at like 100 plus PSI and it's only shooting 140 FPS and uh, it's one of my personal guns so I know it's set up right. right? I know it's been built right. I've been using it for years. It's always shot great. So I'm tearing the thing apart looking for seals, everything. I had the gun apart and back together three times. I got the voltmeter out, testing batteries. <laughs> I'm, I'm checking, I'm, like I'm running the wiring, looking for nicks. I'm going nuts with this thing and finally I got to a point I messaged Dion, I said, hey, uh, do you have any ideas? I've, I've completely exhausted my expertise here. <laughs> and he's like, you need to set the dwell. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, God, fuck. Excuse me, pardon my language. But um, yeah, man, I spent like two days wrenching on that thing for a 10 second problem. Apparently it had, it had dumped its dwell setting. It is, it is one of the, uh, yeah. It's really easy to get tunnel vision on stuff when you're teching stuff, whether it's airsoft guns or like, I do that. I do that working on cars sometimes, just like beating your head against the wall. Yeah. Like, what the heck is going on? Why is this not working? And then it's like, oh, well, if I actually just took a step back and like, it's not actually, it's not actually that hard. I just right. was focused on one thing and couldn't couldn't come up with it. So Casper says, yo, uh, Kiernan said, shot my seven inch MTW at distance yesterday, and it was amazing. I haven't fielded it yet because my local field is moving, building on the new field, but soon I will be able to. Awesome, yeah. I'm going to be honest. I think the shorties are totally underutilized. A, a, a <laughs> high, high recommendation on the little ones. Yeah. Run the real heavy ammo. Uh, yes. If you want to treat yourself, try something at a, at a four uh, or whatever your mags will handle without mid-cap syndrome. But I've, I've got a gun with a four-inch inner barrel, and I load that thing with you fours want, and four threes. You want a beer? I can't, uh, actually. I got okay. a medical thing now. Yeah, I don't drink beer anymore. But I did bring some excellent brandy. If I can steal a glass, I'll drink that. And you're uh, welcome to join me. I will, uh, I, I, I will see whether somebody can track down a glass for us. Somebody's right. usually listening on the stream, so we'll, uh, we'll see if somebody can grab us one. Um, yeah, let's see. Do, 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 do. Scanning through. Um, I watched it and thought it's something artistic or in date or something. Yeah. No, it literally was an accidental stream. We have no idea how it even happened because it was the, it was the two minutes and 37 seconds of silence video that got posted. Okay. Because somehow at the end of the stream last week, it posted to YouTube this two minutes and 37 seconds of black silence. And rather than take it down, we were like, huh, let's just rename the video two minutes and 37 seconds of silence. <clears throat> so... Uh, it was a total accident, <clears throat> but it was fun. 
Um, is it safe to stay to say that when your tank is low on air, like almost empty, that's when you have to set the dwell again after connecting a fresh tank? No, if your if your tank the the electronics, uh, you you don't have to change your dwell setting if you if you run out of air. Just refill the tank and go. Um, I mean, you shouldn't have to change the dwell unless you're, uh, you know, some you're changing setup or if it's actually set up correctly. Um, you know, if if you change your setup, different BB weight, different barrel length, something like that. But just running out of air and refilling, that's. When, and just to be clear about the issue I was talking about earlier, um, I have a weird setup on this gun with a bunch of extra switches and wires that aren't normal uh, <laughs> because I have a, a battery disconnect and an on-gun charge system that I built for myself. So I must have put it into programming mode and changed the dwell myself accidentally. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's not something that you should have to set very often. As long as you're shooting the same weight, it should be set at once and forget it for years at minimum. Yeah, there, there's so the the dwell setting, the rate of fire, all the system settings are stored in solid state memory. So if you unplug the battery, plug it back in, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter as long as you don't. But you can, <clears throat> it happens to people from time to time. Um, there you go. Nice. Awesome. No, 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 nice. Thanks. Um, you, you know, uh, it is. It can be. You can accidentally go into setting mode and you know change something without you know without intending to. So what you got? So this is a uh, Moldovan brandy that I decided to try. Uh, I'm typically mm. a cognac drinker, and I've converted to cognac mostly from whiskeys. Mm. My father loved cognac, and I'm not allowed to drink whiskey anymore. Uh, that's a long conversation, but um, you know we can have it after the stream if you'd like. Yeah, I'll definitely try some. Uh, I was sold out. We'll go go first. I won't. Uh, no, no, no get, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll grab some after the stream. You, you get. All right, fair enough. <clears throat> I got my beer. You, you, you drink your uh, drink your uh, yeah. brandy. <clears throat> well, so the the cognacs were sold out, and I saw this and decided to try it, and it's really, really quite good for the money. So anybody, if you're a whiskey drinker, uh, cognacs and similar brandies are distilled, and mm -hmm. they have a very similar character to whiskey. They're worth trying. Huh. I have never really gotten into brandy, so I'll have to give it a try. Uh, Marty says, afternoon gentlemen, please make a straight grip for the MTW. There's little to no options for AEG mounted grips. Straight grip for the MTW. Not sure what you mean like that. The MTW will fit any real steel grip. So if you want a more vertical grip, uh, there's lots of options for the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so the AR market for more vertical, like a K grip from Magpul. Yeah, the the Magpul <clears throat> K2. Um, you sh you could also look at Hogue makes some yeah. 45 grips, and there's a few companies boutique that make a 45 grip exactly to the measurements of a 1911's grip that actually take oh, 1911 grip panels. Interesting. Uh, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but I've definitely seen that in the wild. I uh, oh my word, Mega Chicken Punch says the limit in my country is 1.9 joules. But I don't like long replicas. Should I go seven-inch version, or is the stock barrel too short to realistically use such power? <clears throat> um, I don't know why y'all are shooting each other for for at one point nine joules with a. You know, mm. So yeah, yeah well, um, for us U.S. players, one point nine is a little hot. Yeah, I I. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I don't know. It's it's funny. Somewhere somewhere in the course of doing this. Because I remember when I was like a, you know, when I was playing when I was a teenager, it was always the game of like, you had to be right at the FPS limit, and you had to be like right yeah. there, and if you weren't, then, you know, it was it was no good, and somewhere along the way, it sort of transitioned to like, well, I mean, if you're in the general ballpark. We, you know, now, we did used <clears throat> to play a lot of 1.8, no yes. MED. Um, that used to be the standard that, That'll here. tear you up. It will. It'll tear it you will. up pretty good. But you, you come you. from a paintball background, so you, you're, uh, yeah. you're you're used to getting pretty, uh, you know, stuff yeah. hitting pretty hard. People ask me all the time which one hurts worse, and I just tell them depends on where you're getting shot. Yep, <laughs> yep, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you can hit 1.9 joules on a uh, on a seven inch, but you'll be pretty high on the pressure range. Uh, might want to look at a ten inch. So yeah, my, very easily do it. <clears throat> my my recommendation for that for pressure and air efficiency, obviously Rich is by far the expert, but uh, for 1.9 joules on a short gun, I want a 300 mil inner barrel. Yeah. Uh, at a at a 602 or a 603, I want a uh, 
three hundred yeah. mil inner. So you're looking at a ten inch. Yeah. yeah. Now you, you can do it, but it, you get you get there's sort of your air efficiency is not quite exponential decline, but pretty close to it. At a higher pressure, you have to run. You know, you, you know, one point you know one point three joules. You can run pretty efficiently on a seven inch gun. You start getting up to having to run 130, 140 PSI and your efficiency, especially on a short barrel, just really, really goes down. So I'd probably run a, a 10 inch barrel if I was gonna be running that hot. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Kevin says I'm running HPA 8.3 BBs, PDI 229 inner barrel, GNG Grimley, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I think I might try those, but uh, try. I think I might try those, but people where I play don't like heavyweight BBs when clearing buildings. Heavyweight heavyweight BBs do hit harder at the and that's not be even even if even at the same energy, <clears throat> they still feel like they hit harder, um, just because they transfer energy more effectively. Well, if, if you don't mind, I've, I've got something for this. I mean, obviously, point three I wouldn't consider to be particularly heavy, not yeah. by modern standards. Um, you know, we run three sixes a lot for zero med milsim stuff, but that's typically an all adult audience. Yep. <laughs> um, what, what I would say is if you're playing indoor, or you're playing up close a lot or like little paintball field style villages uh, where your furthest shot is 75 feet, you don't need to run that heavy. And there is a serious benefit to running lighter ammo, which is it's moving faster yep. at the same jewel, right? So if you're gun fighting, you're snap shooting one person against the other, going back and forth off corners, your ammo is clearing the distance faster than theirs is, is at a lighter weight. Yep. Um, and th this is a reason why at Milsims, the guys on my team, if they're running sidearms, they typically run a lighter weight, like a 2.5 or a 2.8 in a sidearm, and then the primaries are getting the heavier 3.2, 3.6, you know, and higher stuff. Um, but consider that heavy is not always the best yeah. solution. Uh, that being said, what people like and what is acceptable are not always the same thing, right? Can't please everyone. So if, the, if it's site legal to play with a point three, it should be probably fine to do so. We just say, you know, be courteous, right? If it's birthday kids, if it's 10 year olds, uh, maybe change your play style, turn your gun down. But uh, you know, if it's you and a, and a bunch of other, well, I'm touching 40 and, and when I'm playing against people my age, I pull zero punches. Yeah. Well, and it's also different. I mean, the difference playing at a Milsim event, right. the kit is relevant. To energy level as well right. because you know most you know, in general you're getting shot somewhere center of mass most of the time or if, if it's a solid hit if it's not you know you may catch a glance you know like they just barely barely grab your arm or something like that okay not that big a deal but if it's a solid direct hit where it's transferring energy it's generally kind of center of mass and most people playing at milsim are running some sort of complete yeah. kit and so you, you, you know, you feel it, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hit the same way as, you know, right. the 15-year-old the out there in a t-shirt that you just, you know, nailed in the chest from point blank with a <clears throat> heavyweight BBs. That, that hurts a lot more. So, well, and, and different I, situations. I would challenge you a little bit and say if you're playing right, uh, you're probably getting shot in the side of your head and your support hand most often. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, no, That's absolutely. That's all should be seeing. But I guess my point is those are... Um, those are usually glancing hits anyway. Yeah. So they you I mean support hand or support hand you can get nailed pretty bad regardless. Yeah. But generally the the ones where you're just you know you're peeking around and you just yeah. you kind of get clipped. It just kind it's a glancing blow. It's not direct. The the direct hits are usually you know somebody blindsides you. You know right. Yeah, you know, you're you're looking this way and he comes around the building behind you and, and nails you in the back. Yeah. Well, he hits you in the backpack because. You know, you got a backpack on, you got a plate carrier, and that's that's what you got. Yeah. Um, you know, it's and and in the in the head case, most people at Milson wear on a helmet. Yeah, that's or true. at least a hat and or something. Are are aware of and accepting of the risk. Yeah, you know, there's there's not a ton of people playing that type of game that aren't expecting to get shot up. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's a game of, of honor and courtesy first, yep. right? Uh, and so the point is, choose what you need to choose to make sure that you're having a great time and that everybody you're playing with is having a great time. But also, if people are just whining because you have good equipment and a good setup and you're catching them <laughs> off guard a lot, that's, maybe that's don't take that to the bank. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's their problem. Uh, let's see. I had a question up here. 
uh, do we plan on launching the Forge but seven inch version? I don't know. We've discussed that. We are planning to relaunch Forge later this year. Um, I've mentioned this on a couple streams up till now, uh, but there is um, we have gotten our hands on some forgings, so we, we are going to be able to relaunch the Forge line. We actually were just having this discussion the other day. Should we do a seven inch version of the Forged? You can give us your thoughts. I'm not really sure. We're, we're trying, you know, as we're continuing to, um, as we're continuing to grow, we're, we're trying to find the right balance between offering enough options and not offering stuff that, you know, three people want to buy. Because you just can't, you, well, you can't justify it. Here's, here's a, a question for that. Um, do you make the outer barrels available? Yes, the outer barrels uh, are I, separately available. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I know they've been in the past. I wasn't sure with supply chain where that was at now. But yeah, if you want a, a seven inch forged, uh, you are an outer barrel, an inner barrel, and a rail away from making that happen. If you want to even go with the shorter rail. Some people would want the seven inch barrel and then just run a suppressor yeah. inside Talk the 10 it. inch rail. Talk it. You know, so um, yeah, it's definitely doable. It just depends on what you want to do. But we, we're, you know, we try to balance like, you know, what's the. Um, we want to offer enough stuff that most people can order something that's really close to what they want. But you, you know, we're still a small company. You know, we you know we can't offer you know eight hundred models that are all you know just a tiny tiny bit different. And you know, most of those only a tiny number of people order. Um, so ah, see what see what else we got on here. Evening from the UK. Jen's treated myself to a forged. Uh, Wolverine ten point three the other day. No, no, no going back to anything else. What a beast! Yeah. welcome, <laughs> welcome to the club. A bunch of us feel that way. Yeah, it, it really is hard. Um, it, it it's really hard once you get used to running the MTW platform to justify going back to anything else. Like if you're at all pragmatic, if if all you care about is a certain aesthetic and like. Hey, this right. model has this particular, you know. Then, but if you're, if you're at all, you know, pragmatic about sort of performance, serviceability, you know, durability, stuff like that, it's just so hard to go back. There's just so many things that are just easy to do with it, and some of it's not even stuff that that maybe a lot of people think about right up front. Like one of the things I realized really quickly once I started designing, and you know, we had prototypes in, and I was working on them all the time. You know, first round of prototypes was I can actually like work on this like it's a real thing I don't have to baby every little piece of this like it's a, a toy that if I'm if I if I'm not super careful I'm gonna strip this screw like right. I can I can wrench on this thing I can do what I need to to get it done and that's well un un until a few years ago uh, airsoft <clears throat> guns were Swiss clocks made of Swiss cheese yeah. And, uh, that's, and that's not that, true anymore. Look, that's a really, that's a really. <laughs> for me, the big thing is performance to dollar, right? Yep. It's accessibility to the highest level of performance in the sport. If you buy an MTW, and you want to recreate that from <clears throat> traditional airsoft parts mm -hmm. in a drop-in kit, now I understand people want an aesthetic, a different experience. They have a different application. All that's great. I have guns that are not MTWs, but if I had a 10-inch MTW sitting in front of me, and you came to me and said, "Hey," Can you build me this, but out of, you know, this Crytac or this SEMA or whatever? Yes, I can. I can get you to a point where you have 90% of the durability and 100% of the performance of the MTW. Guess what? It's going to cost you double or more mm -hmm. uh, because I'm going to have to put set screws in it. I'm going to have to reinforce the body. I'm going to have to spend hours and hours tuning the thing and getting it right. You know, it's going to require a custom hop-up. It's going to require all this stuff. MTW, pick it up, battery, airline, BBs, and, uh, you know, 99% of the time they're going to be perfect. They're going to shoot laser beams, and they're going to outperform almost everything else. Uh, and, and that's it. There, there just is no better value for the for the performance. I haven't seen anything that even comes close for the money. That's, I mean, that, that's always been my, you know, sort of my philosophy in designing products. Is, you know, how do you, how do you develop, how do we... Because <clears throat> I'm I'm a little different maybe than some people that run companies in that I am more willing I'm far more willing to figure out how to deliver a high value product than I am 
to spend a much bunch of time and energy developing a marketing scheme to convince you that it's a high value product, even though it's not. I, I it's I would prefer to just find a way to make a high value product so that <clears throat> when it comes to marketing and it's not hard, I chuck it against a wall and you go, oh, okay, I get it now. Like you know, yep. I don't have to come up with some elaborate marketing scheme to to convince you <clears throat> that this is <clears throat> that this is better. We just have to show you what it is. We just have to find, you know, marketing uh, amounts to, okay, how do we just communicate what this actually is? Not, you know, trying to convince you that it's something it's not. Here's a question. <clears throat> um, 416 upper for the MTW. Um, <clears throat> I have questions about this because we theoretically could do it. Ish. Big ish. Right. Um, we can't do the licensing. There is no way on the planet that H and K is going to give us licensing. I've already looked into it. I, it maybe, <clears throat> maybe at some point in the future it might theoretically be possible, but right now they're just way too stingy on their licensing. Um, so I could make an upper that is really close to a four sixteen upper in terms of like the geometry, uh, but. I can't make the trademarks, so how much is that worth? Like, you know, are you willing to build a gun that just has <clears throat> the upper geometry but doesn't have the trademarks? You know, uh, I also have an issue with rails, right? We don't have, I mean, I would have to, I'd have to create and, I'd have to create a whole new rail that's a 416 style rail with the taller, you know, rail, top rail height um, if we wanted to do complete guns. And it still wouldn't be licensed. It would still all just be, Four sixteen ish, you know. Well, I, I, I have a, a thought about this, which is, you know, I, this is something I hear all the time, right? Because we demo MTWs and we ask people about them, and we hear the same thing, right? People want an AK, people want an MP5, people want various different models because they like that out of the box, next to no tuning functionality. The problem with that is, you have a, a huge component in terms of design, in terms of licensing, in terms of machining to do these other styles, and it's it's a little different the business model how that works with somebody like SEMA or how licensing works through Humorex, right? That's not the space that uh, Wolverine's in, at least not as I understand it. What I will say is this: what I was saying earlier about how you can have that same performance but you're going to pay more, right? The drop-in kits are still excellent, guys. Yeah. Right? The Inferno Gen Two kits they There's still exist. There's a lot of people that still go that way. A yeah. lot of people still yeah. do that. I, I actually just built an MP5 <clears throat> like that, which I'm very happy with. But, you know, the point is you can have next to anything you want. If it's got a V2, a 2.5, or a V3 gearbox in it, Wolverine performance, Wolverine reliability are absolutely installable. Now, in that case, you're going to need the right builder, and you're going to need to put a little bit more love and probably a little bit more money into it. Um, but you can get it. Uh, you know, 416 is not out of the realm of possibilities. The, the issue is doing it out of the box what's the demand for that yeah. versus every other m4 and and you know <clears throat> yeah it's just it you know at the, at the end of the day i have to <clears throat> I, I have to i have to play trade-offs here you know because i'm i'm running a business right. right i you know i love airsoft i've been doing it for years i enjoy doing this and i want to do cool stuff <clears throat> but i can only afford to do cool stuff if i can pay the bills <laughs> You know, so it's like yeah. I, I gotta I gotta kind of balance the stuff that I really want to do with you know what we can actually sell and what we can justify in terms of cost because yeah you know, it's again if you're not in the 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 business world especially like product development world it's really easy to underestimate how much it costs just to do the development not even the production just the development on a you know, let's say a new upper, right? Because if, you know, if you, you have, you know, a hundred hours of engineering time, right? Once you get through all the design and all the, you know, setting up the machining, and then you have who knows how many hours of prototyping time on the machine uh, that that machine now can't run production because it's running prototyping. Well, you have to, that's money out of your pocket, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it it adds up really, really quick. Stuff that you that it looks from the outside, you're like, oh, it's, this isn't that big, big a deal. It's really similar. 
if you actually get, you know, you actually start adding up, well, you're going to have to do this, we're going to have to do that, and, it, you know, we can't do this because we're doing that, opportunity cost, for those of you that are, you know, taking some basic economics, um, you know, it adds up really, really quick, and we're not, you know, we're, we're, we're not a, you know, Vietnamese-based machine shop where our billable rates are, you know, $10 an hour for an engineer. Yeah, engineering time in the U.S. is freaking expensive. Well, and you're, no offense to anybody overseas that doesn't do this, no, it, uh, and I, I don't want it to seem like everyone does, but there are a lot of overseas companies and a few domestically that are sort of unscrupulous about where their sure. designs are coming from, right? And you yep. guys are taking the time and trouble to do the engineering in-house instead of ripping somebody off. But that development cost is why you see l very low-cost copies of products. Yep. Uh, you know, oftentimes coming out the same week or the same month that the uh, original product did. Not just in airsoft, but in all industries. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You, I mean, you see yeah, that in, in tons of industries. It's um, especially in clothing and electronics and home goods. Yeah. I mean, the the world is rife with ripoffs, and the you know the reality is, if you want innovation, uh, you're gonna have to pay somebody to innovate. Yep, and it's it's a different it's a di different skill set <clears throat> to manufacture repeatedly because that's that's one thing that, that a, a lot of companies in in the Asian realm have really mastered yep. is manufacturing they, if you tell them hey I want this exact thing man they can make that thing for you <laughs> like you, you, whatever it is they'll find a way to make it for you and as long as you tell them exactly how you want them to make it they'll make it the same way every freaking time <clears throat> but you know you know we, we talk about the example of a screw you know, if in in the U.S., if you go buy, a, if you you go to a company and say, "Hey, I, I need a screw," they're gonna say, "Okay, well, um, here's a screw, and it'll be, you know, not terribly expensive, but not super cheap, but it'll be a standard screw, you know, just how it should be." <clears throat> you go to you go to somewhere in Asia and you say, "Hey, I need a screw," and you don't specify, "Hey, it needs to be this specific type of screw." Well, you're going to get a rusty screw that they have laying the ground, and it's going to cost you absolutely nothing because, like, hey, you didn't specify what you need. We got the cheapest right. screw that we could possibly get you. It's the same way with anything. If you don't specify exactly what it is you need, they will find the least expensive way to do it, and they will give you the bare minimum that meets what it is you said you needed. So, um, That's <laughs> how you end up with... Airsoft guns with zinc alloy bodies that <laughs> crack in half if you look at them wrong. Uh, are we going to do an, another Bluetooth FCU? I don't know. That's a totally honest answer. Maybe. Uh, they Bluetooth screwed us over and discontinued support for the chip that we are making, we are using. And so it's going to cost us another $8,000 just to register the stupid board if we want to do a new design. And so, if we're going to go to all that trouble, then we want to design a whole new board and do something, you know, update all the software and all the firmware and just like, so it's a big project if we want to do it, and I, we, we haven't decided yet whether or not we're going to jump into that. <clears throat> um, let's see. Update the dealer's list in Europe. Um, uh, I'll, I'll ping Dalton about that and see what we can do. We, so... A lot of European distribution goes through Red Wolf in Spain, so we <clears throat> we don't get as good information on a sort of up-to-date dealer lists, and certainly not who's selling what. Uh, you said a lot of them don't sell MTW. I I have like no information on that, like which dealer sells what in in a lot of Europe. And we do sell directly to some dealers in Europe, but uh, you know a lot of that goes through uh, through Red Wolf in in Spain, so it's kind of hard to hard for us to keep that information super up to date. Uh, let's see. Uh, jump back over to Facebook. MDW LMG upper like the Crytac. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really like that design personally. That's just that's well, me. I'm. <laughs> no, I, I have a thought on that, which I hope you won't mind me saying live. Um, but that doesn't need to be an upper, right? That can be a costume kit. You have like a little clamshell thing. Yeah, that I guess on the outside. I, I, that's a thought. Just a totally cosmetic. 
Yeah, you know, through maybe even 3D print it. Yeah, make it you know an adapter for a, a belt, you know, simulated. Yeah, yeah that's a thought. I, had... I how how realistic <clears throat> does it? I, you know, how, right. <laughs> how true to form do people want it? Do they want a Shrike or or something like that, or you know, do they want a specific yeah. replica? Um, because those are two different considerations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to do a support weapon. It's another one, though, that comes down to, I don't know, and I, we talk about this a lot of weeks on the show here, it's, it's something we get requests for frequently, but I don't know how cost-effectively we could do it. I sort of feel like if we if we were going to do it, it would have to be sort of a, a, a Gucci product that we make a small quantity of, and mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's going to be super expensive, but if you want a, a super killer, you know... <laughs> Out of the box, ready to go, HPA support weapon. Then, then here's your here's your ticket. But um, I, I don't know that we can manufacture them efficiently enough, just because of s- some of the stuff that, in terms of how how they're designed. I don't know whether we could manufacture them efficiently enough that we could hit like a really competitive price point. It's kind of funny because like back when I got into airsoft, you know, shoot, fifteen years ago or so, fifteen more than that, no. Never mind. Shoot, I'm uh, 20 years ago. Doggone it! I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, 20 years ago, <clears throat> you know, you went to you went to the airsoft shop and like all the all the M4 and AK style guns. If if you wanted like, back then, you, you basically had Classic Army and uh, Tokyo Marui and then a bunch of cheap knockoffs. And Classic Army and Tokyo Marui were both about. Three hundred dollars for a, an M4 or an AK mm-hmm. or something like that. It was about what it was. If you went Classic Army, you got the the metal body. If you went Tokyo Marui, you got the plastic body with whatever fairy dust they sprinkled in there. Um, but then the this if you wanted an M249, it was like a thousand bucks. Like I mean, there was a huge difference in the price point between no. a, a you know, and ne- but now it's like you can pick up an M249 for the same price you can a and M4, and it's kind of it, uh, maybe, maybe a little more, you know. Maybe instead of 350, it's 400. But like, there's not a huge difference in the price anymore, and it's kind of, I don't know. Uh, well, I'm not, the, maybe they just got, were able to produce them in enough volume that that, that I, they could. I bring think the price there's up. been some some pretty important design change. Now, I'm not an expert on AEGs, but I've seen some stuff where the newer ones have smaller uh, gearboxes that are much more similar to like a, a standard V2 or 2.5. Versus the old ones used to have this crazy proprietary gearbox oh, yeah. with this transverse mounted motor. And, you know, it, it seems like these days uh, it's easier for certain companies to make the, the internals durable without making them huge. Right. So they have less involved, uh, less invested in the internals. They're making them more efficiently using less material. But, you know, that's all a guess. I, I'm not, a, not an AEG guy. Yeah. All right, let's see. Take a couple more, and then we'll probably wrap it. Oh, I was going to do a demo for you guys today, and I didn't even have a gun here to do it. Dang it. I was going to show you how the tensioning screw between the upper and lower works, but I didn't even get one in with me, so sorry. I'm a little little mixed up today. Things have been crazy. Glenn asks, as always, M249, MTW, when? Glenn's one of the guys that works for right. me. He, he always gets on here. And he, <laughs> he wants a, an M249 MTW. Um, well, now, now I don't feel bad because you're being harassed <laughs> live by your own <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, make a, an HPA engine to be designed for the TAC-41. I looked at it. I determined that it is possible to do. I have not had bandwidth to do it, um, is just the, the honest answer. Um, we're, you know, it's, I don't think it's any secret, but we're, while we are still supporting and making improvements on the aftermarket side of things, we're pushing pretty freaking hard on complete gun uh, sort of product lines. So, you know, that's that's where a lot of my time and focus is is right now as well as on the business side you know um you know we're we're doing a lot of stuff uh may have some fun stuff to to tell you guys about here in the future 
uh, not too far away, we hope. But, um, you know, just, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot of stuff. I, I, I have two to three years probably worth of new products already developed and sort of ready to push out as soon as manufacturing can handle it and, you know, the market can handle it. And, uh, you know, because if I put, you know, if I put three new things out all at once, then, you know, everybody's only going to buy one of them. If I put one out now and I put one out six months from now, then everybody will buy all of them. And oh, yeah. <laughs> you, that's kind of how it you, works. Do you remember the old uh, Andy Cab cartoons where the fly coming out of his wallet? It used to be this. Anyway, it, it was an, an old comic strip back in the day, but the, the point is, I'm going to end up oh, spending yeah, way yeah, too yeah, much yeah. money with you guys. About. Yeah, but uh, Brandon says he'll be poor. Yeah, cool. Thanks yeah for Brandon, that. you and me both. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to. Um, it's just, it, it, it has not made it to the top of my priorities list. Uh, I, this is when, I'm going to answer this one, and then we're going to wrap up. Will it come? Uh, will we make some sort of recoil system for the MTW Quake or something else? Um, this is another one I can honestly say I don't know on. I have a system designed that does that. Um, we have a prototype of it. It works pretty decent. You know, it, it's all right. Uh, it's another thing that just has not made it to the top of the priority list in terms of. Um, I don't know, and uh, I'm, this honestly comes down to, and I've told you this before, once bitten, twice shy, everybody told me for like three years, oh, if you make a recoil system, everybody will buy it, and I'll buy it, and everybody, you know, whatever. I said, okay, I'll make a recoil system. Then I made it, and not very many people bought it. So I'm like, okay. And I know some things, you know, I, I know that it was uh, too complicated and too expensive, basically. But what I don't know is how simple and how inexpensive does it need to be for people to actually buy it. So, like, right. the new system is less complicated and less expensive, but how, inexp you know, are people only willing to spend 50 bucks for a recoil add-on, or are they willing to spend 150 bucks? You know, like, what's the, like, you know, what's the, you know, that, that line where they go, okay, like, this is actually worth doing, um, versus, you know, eh, well, that's cool, but I'm not actually going to put it on my gun. Um, and I think that's what a lot of it came down to last time is people were like, oh, that's really cool. But eh, yeah, it's just really not worth it. I, I'm, I'm going to do something else. Like it, it's, it's a cool factor, but so I don't know if we'll release it. Um, we might at some point, but I don't have any definite plans. So, uh, you know, don't, don't take my word, you know, as don't take me saying this as a guarantee that we're going to do it. <clears throat> um, um, all right, I think I'm going to wrap it up today, guys. Uh, thanks for everybody that jo jumped on. And uh, sorry, I've been a little discombobulated. It's how I feel today. So this is, you know, this is just a, a real reflection of what's going on. Uh, Hang on, we've got one more I'm going to try here. What's the realistic month I can lay my hands on Billet Tactical and the new regulator in Europe? Uh, how do I not miss the next live? Uh, next live, uh, subscribe and set yourself a reminder. Uh, and then Billet Tactical, uh, we plan to start shipping in May. But that's when we say start shipping, that means start shipping. It doesn't mean it's going to be everywhere at that date, like the 9 millimeters. We're going to start shipping this month. They're not going to be everywhere this month. There's going to be some that go out this month, and then they're going to continue going out, and probably the majority of people will see them show up at their local shop, you know, if there's any left. We already have dealers that have pre-sold all the ones they ordered and are placing second orders, so, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you know. But a lot of shops will start actually getting them probably, you know, middle of next month is sort of a realistic. There's going to be some that go out this month, but, you know, that's just how production works. And when we say start shipping, I'm not guaranteeing that everybody's getting one on that date because, you know, we're not starting shipping and shipping a container that's, you know, 5,000 guns, right? It's just we're going to start shipping them, and as they come through the pr through production, we ship them. So, uh, May, if you're in Europe, 
realistically things take at least a month to get by the time we ship it it crosses on the sea turtle and you know because everything pretty much has to go ocean freight um, so it, it crosses on the sea turtle and gets there and goes through customs. That's at least another month, realistically. And then so you're, and then it has to get from the distributor to your store or whatever else. So probably July would be my guess by the time you actually see them physically in Europe. Best guess. Um, but we'll see. All right. That's it for today. Thanks for jumping on, guys. Thanks and for having me. We will see you guys next time.